Hello there, Sir from 17 once again, introducing you to my Batman Arkham City Hard Plus Difficulty video walkthrough. This is the Mr. Freeze boss fight. But first we've got to get to him. And uh, before we get to him, we're going to be going down here and interrogating an old friend by the name of Quincy Sharp. And uh, I, I think I interrogate Quincy. I'll soon find out. I'm just having a bit of fun here flying around the city like an idiot. But uh, this boss fight is interesting that's coming up anyhow, regardless as if, if we interrogate Quincy or if we don't. And it's awkward as balls. It's really awkward. And I think the reason why I'm having trouble finding where the fuck I'm supposed to go is because of that level up thing blocking my damn compass. But I've noticed that there's an objective there. I've just realised it's interrogating uh, Quincy Sharp, which you've probably got to do. So I'm going to turn around, make a beeline straight for him. So my bad. But Mr. Freeze, you have to do a, a sequence of takedowns on him. Everything from you know hitting him with with a wall that you've used the explosive, you know, Batman toothpaste on or electrocuting him with the the gun that fires electricity or a silent takedown from behind or a dropping takedown pretty much every single takedown you can do be it a ledge be it a, you know a glide kick be it a line gun kick you have to do to Mr. Freeze and the luxury of this fight is you don't have to do them all you just have to do enough to drop his life bar down and I do not do them all in this video which gives you hope if there's some that you're having trouble doing and if you look on the internet, there's probably some fantastic lists of all the different takedowns you can use against him. And you can do the ones you're confident with, you can do the ones you think you can do, and you can avoid the ones you can't. And um, that is pretty much the way to fight him. When you do fight him, though, it's a little bit different, because on the first time through the game, uh, he, he, walk, he chases you down by tracking your footsteps. And he's kind of slow, because he only walks, he doesn't run, but you're obviously leaving heated footsteps behind so he will follow your path almost perfectly and you need to use this to your advantage to to exploit this and you need to move him in the way of traps so that you can take him down and he'll fire these tra these scanners at that try and find you when he doesn't know where you are which you can kill by throwing batmerangs at them they're not too too dangerous they can do massive damage to you though if, you, if you're not careful so be careful of that but that's really the only problems left when you fight him the first time it doesn't seem to be anything else that's really an issue he can shoot you with his gun he can shoot from some really big distances and use ice grenades and things but it's all pretty standard and pretty easy on a new game plus however he jams you and I don't remember him doing this in in the first playthrough so you get to the point where your detective vision's completely useless so I would advise you to do this fight purely on your own sight don't rely on detective vision because if he takes it off you you're gonna have trouble without it and it's not too bad once you once you get used to it. You'll probably die a few times when you're fighting him just because you make mistakes and he does a lot of damage. But it's not that bad. I do believe a lot of people on forums are exaggerating the difficulty of the fight. But difficulty subjective, so to some it might be easy, to some it might be the hardest thing we've ever done. It all depends on your skill level and, and how much patience and experience you have, I suppose. But... I'm going to go back to talking about Batman Returns because this fight here is kind of awkward on New Game Plus because of the dudes with the fucking doors. But you can do the disarm um, execution which gets rid of the weapon and uh, destroys it. There are, there are a bunch of techniques you can do. You can also use the explosive gel or toothpaste as I call it and it will knock them on their ass and get rid of the door which is really useful. But um, just be careful and use the, the armored dude to build your combo. He's always super useful for that. But in the last video, I was talking about Batman Returns, one of the best Batman films ever made. Exceptionally dark, filled with great performances, and a fantastic masquerade scene, which you just don't see enough for my liking. And I know there was one in Eyes Wide Shut, but I don't count that, because that film's a giant fucking abortion. But just look at Labyrinth. Labyrinth had, had an awesome masquerade scene, and so does Batman, and it's just... Masquerades aren't used enough, and I like masquerades. But there's also, I mean, Danny DeVito as, as the Penguin, he's so good. It's, it's like he was born to, to do that role. He's so perfect in it, and he plays it fantastically. And um, I especially like the, the, the end one. The end one is, is, is great, where he, where he dies. Uh, spoiler alert. 
and I just love it how he comes out of the water and he's he's all cut to ribbons and his blood's all black and inky and it just looks nasty. He's got all that green shit coming out of his mouth and everything around them is all cracking. There's glass falling, there's cinders going everywhere, there's sparks, there's machinery crumbling. It's all gonna hell. And he, and he just comes out of this water. There's the awesome musical piece. I think it's from Danny Elfman. And uh, it's just absolutely apt and perfect. And he comes out and he just does the whole... I just want a glass of cold ice water. And then, like, falls down and dies. And then all the penguins come out of the, the water and they pick him up and they take him into the water. And it's just it's just an awesomely just strange and bizarre but really, really fitting scene. And then there's my favourite part of the film which is when Batman tears his mask off. And I know that goes against pretty much everything the comics stand for and, and all the illusion of what Batman is, but there's just something about that sequence where he, he goes from being this, this idol, to this, this, this figure of good, this, you know, this, this symbol for people, for protection and for everything that is justice and, and right in Gotham, to being this vulnerable man who's in love. And he's trying to, to get the, the, the woman he loves to to understand and, and to, to stop this destructive pattern that she's on and she just won't because she doesn't know how to she's too far gone just like him in essence and it's just this really touching and awesome moment and if you've not seen it it, it is fucking awesome check it out and uh, awesome awesome film you need to check it out but Batman Forever came after that and Batman Forever was a completely different type of film and the reason for this was that I think it was Warner Brothers or 20th Century Fox. I'm not too sure on who owns the rights to things. I should research it, but at the end of the day, this is all off the cuff. I'm not, you know, fucking spending 40 minutes writing this shit down. But the people that were funding the movie thought Tim Burton's films were getting far too dark. They didn't think they were going to appeal to the demographic of the audience, you know, because they obviously think comics are for children. They don't think they should have any kind of adult connotation. It should be very, you know, slapsticky, friendly, colourful and um, childish. And unfortunately, that is exactly what we got with Batman Forever. Because they got Joel Schumacher at the helm, I believe his name is. And this guy's notorious for doing extremely colourful and flamboyant films that uh, are artsy and just, you know, a little bit less serious than, than other directors. And don't get me wrong, when Batman Forever first came out, I was still pretty damn young, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. Jim Carrey is a fantastic Riddler. He plays the role perfectly. Tommy Lee Jones is a fantastic Two-Face. He, he, he's equally good. And Val Kilmer isn't that bad a Batman. He's, he's brooding. He's just the right amount of brooding. He's kind of cool. He's, he's got things going for him. And I do like Val Kilmer. I've got a bit of a man crush on our Val before he got fat. But <laughs> he's a decent Batman. And how cool does that look when he gets ice on his cape? I didn't even realise that could happen till I were recording this run. But it was a definitely a different tone throughout. It was nowhere near as serious, it was nowhere near as adult or as dark. And it lost something for me because I really liked that old aesthetic. But it was still kind of cool, if a little bit, you know, cheesy. They introduced Robin and I do like Chris O'Donnell. He did a fantastic you know, role as, as, as Robin, he was he was cool, and there's some interesting things that happen, but as I get older and I watch it again, and I look back and I just think, why the fuck did they change it so much, why was that dynamic altered, just for the sake of, of a demographic that, that will watch anything with fucking colours in it, it just seems so patronising to me that they kind of diminished the value of what Batman was for the sake of that. And I do know that it came from, you know, more slapsticky origins, because just look at the, the Adam West one, which was preposterously dumb, yet still brilliant, and all that good stuff. And it was probably more of a wink to those films, but I didn't like it all that much. And Joel Schumacher got the next Batman film, which was Batman and Robin. And if anybody's seen this film, my fucking God, is that a bad film. Everything about it is dumb, everything about it is childish, it's completely just, we'll put as much as we can into one movie, make it an entire clusterfuck that the kids all love because it makes no coherent sense, and we'll make a bat suit with nipples. And if that isn't enough to offend you, then they'll put George Clooney in aforementioned bat suit, which is just the last and final fucking straw, because don't get me wrong, I like George Clooney, but he made a bad Batman. 
And then they introduced Bat Girl and Bat Dog and Bat Bird and Bat Fucking World, and it it was just horrible. It had Arnold Schwar Schwartz. It had Arnold Schwarzenegger being a clown. It had a ridiculously looking Bane. It had Poison Ivy as Uma Thurma, which was actually pretty cool. She she did a good performance, and she looked surprisingly attractive in that role. When usually I think she looks a bit like a man or a horse, and uh, it was just weak on all fronts, and it kind of killed Batman. It was kind of, you know, the, the coat hanger that performed the back alley, a back alley abortion of the Batman series. And a couple of years later, we got Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins, which brought it completely grounded to planet Earth, completely less colourful and more mundane, but a whole lot more real than it ever was before. They did the, the Casino Royal to the Batman series, they made Batman a human being, they made him vulnerable, they made him interesting, and they gave him a backstory. It wasn't just, you know, brooding guy whose family dies, it was a hell of a lot more, and it also introduced the, the majesty that is Christian Bale, and uh, I am a massive Christian Bale fan. He hasn't done all that many movies lately, but I, I pretty much ep on his every word, because the guy's a fantastic actor, he's a bit of a psycho, but I think that's why I like him. And Batman Begins, not only is it a fantastic film by a fantastic director in a new fantastic direction, but it's also got the, the utter jewel that is Liam Neeson, who I absolutely adore as an actor, and um, he does a fantastic role as, as the villain. There's, there's a nice little cameo by Cillian Murphy as the Scarecrow. He doesn't really do much, and uh, Tom Wilkinson's in there for good measure, but it's just a sublime piece of filmmaking, and it restored my faith in Batman excuse me, and a lot of other people's faith in it too, after slapsticky and silly films that were aimed for children, and now it was back in, you know, back at the helm of, of aimed for everybody, because you don't have to have talking animals and make everything neon bright to appeal to, to, to children. We, we, we look at kids these days and we think that they're just these fucking riddling, addled bunch of, you know, sugar and hyperactivity and no intelligence when... My nephews are, are real fucking smart. They may, they might not be academically smart at things right now, but when it comes to their understanding of, of the world or the world that they live in, they're, they're pretty clever, man. They're, you don't have to dub everything down for kids because that's how people learn. Uh, I do believe half of the intellect that I have comes from the fact I watched far too many movies when I was younger. And there's a lot of kids these days that are missing out on that just because parents are, you know, like, you can't watch an 18 movie, it's, it's not good for you, or you'll, you'll end up killing your entire family and saying Morpheus told you to do it. All that kind of bullshit, saying you'll get disenfranchised and, and become, you know, a devil worshipper or something. Which is preposterous, because at the end of the day, you know, if you're a fucking psycho, it doesn't matter if you've watched a film that triggered you to do psychotic things. It doesn't matter if you, you were sat hugging a Care Bear, you're still going to be a fucking psycho. End of story. It's just who you are, unfortunately, and, and it kind of blows, but... Batman Begins brought it back to where it needed to be, and it paved the way to another one of the best Batman films ever made, which is The Dark Knight. But I'm going to talk about that one on the next video, and uh, we're just going to keep punching in Mr. Freeze's face. And that is the end of the boss fight, so once again, people, thanks for watching, thanks for listening. I hope the guy's helping, and you take care now.